<laughs> so when I clapped, I'm like, ooh, that's pain. You have, your hands are made of steel. They're just I like... I don't know. It was before, my hand has just been painful for quite a while, for a couple of days. And I think I just slept on it, like folded over. So now the crease oh, okay. in my hand is like very stiff. Okay. I thought you were saying that like one of your hands just has like a mysterious amount of force behind it. Like no. you... You have one very muscular arm without realizing it. No, just one hand is really weak at the moment. It's quite tender. And then because I was thinking, it's probably good that you're asexual, because if you're ever in a sexual <laughs> context, a guy might be like, I want you to slap me, and you would, and you'd break his fucking yeah, neck, Yeah, with my Alice, powerful... He... Mom, I don't know. I haven't tested the power of this hand, because I don't slap a lot of people. It's not something that I'm... You're going to have do. to slap someone just to see if they survive. Pick someone you don't like, obviously. Yeah, okay, um, right. Or someone who won't be missed because they might. There's a good chance that they'll die. <laughs> I, I, I just don't know. Who could I? Who or what could I slap with this hand? Perhaps I could who do don't? like a scientific experiment, right? Someone's on the deathbed, and I'll be like, "Look." <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! That's grim. That's a grim way to start this podcast today. I might even include that. Um, <laughs> hello and welcome to The Red Menace, where a comedy news podcast bringing you the latest and greatest of hits from inside our respective bedrooms, because that's where the hottest content in the world is made. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. In terms of podcast audio and nothing else. Yeah, that's, that's about all that people. happens in this room. Um, my name's Chris Bolson. That's and I'm Alison Hall. Um, we didn't talk at all about what we were going to do in the intro, but I feel like we've done a little intro about your murder hand. About my, so, yeah, magic hand that probably the, could maim and kill people, but I don't know because I've never tested out its power. Do we want to just, like, get straight into it and do stories? Do we want to just, like... <sighs> well, we could do the, that. Okay. Do you have one? <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, I do have some stories. Otherwise, we would be in a little bit of a pickle if we didn't come into this with stories. That is true. It is part of the job description. It I is say part job of... as though we we get paid, which is inaccurate. <laughs> which um, is incredibly inaccurate. <laughs> it's part of the hobby description. Yeah, it's part of what we need to do. Uh, the work for exposure description. I do have a lot of animal-related stories this week, as per usual. That is your, your second brand, is you've got cults and you've got animals, so yeah, I'm, well, I'm happy with this. This is an animal story that I thought was quite interesting, actually. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm actually going from the smithsonianmagazine.com. Oh. Yeah, so you know it's very scientific content yeah. that we're diving into. I love how varied our sources are getting. It's very <laughs> fun to me. I did, my other two stories are more local. So I thought I'd start off with this one because, look, okay. I really like this story. It's a very relatable content from a scientific magazine about Let's animals. Do it. Okay. Um, and it's about bats. Okay. Yeah. And basically the crux of the story is that some researchers have done some work to translate what bats are talking about when they are in their little bat huddles on the cave ceiling. Oh, God. <laughs> so, <laughs> Surely it must be, look at those dipshits taking photos of us. Why are they doing that? <laughs> what, do you, what, what do you think bats would be talking about? I think that if they're fruit bats, they're just saying the word fruit over and over again. So one of them is just like, fruit. The other one's like, fruit, 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 fruit. Um, if they're... <laughs> They're Vampire just saying bats. the names of various types of fruit. Yes, one of them's just like, kiwi, mango, banana, <sighs> banana, and then they all chime together and say banana together. Absolutely. 
Um, I don't know what vampire bats talk about, but they do do it in the Dracula accent. They do. They all put on... But that's not their natural accent. They all put on that accent. (laughs) They're all from Pennsylvania, but they they deliberately sound like that. They try and put on the Transylvanian accent. You know, it's, it's just how it is. It might be a little bit racist. It might be a little bit stereotyping of, like, Romanian people. But bats... I don't know if bats are woke. I don't think they're woke. No. Well, we, can, we, can we cancel a bat? I don't know. We'll try. I, well, we could. We could. We could can we cancel we can a cancel, whole species? We can cancel a bat man. I don't know if we can cancel a bat. I don't. Yeah, I don't think it's quite fair. But anyway, no. it says here, the headline goes, researchers translate bat talk. Turns out they argue a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell, Jeremy. <laughs> Get off my branch. That's essentially what they're saying, Chris. <laughs> so it says, a machine learning algorithm helped decode the squeaks Egyptian fruit bats make in their roost, revealing that they speak to one another as individuals. And this is by Jason Daly at smithsonian.com, which is very cool. Yes. Very cool content. So I'm going to dive into this a little bit more. Plenty of animals communicate with one another, at least in a general way. Wolves howl to each other, birds sing and dance to attract mates, and big cats mark their territory with urine. But researchers... I, I just, sorry, I love... So we, get, we have in there shouting, dancing because they want to fuck, and pissing on stuff. Is yeah, exactly. The That's the three pulls. forms of communication. <laughs> nice. <laughs> exactly. Shouting across the... Across the plains. The wilderness. Yeah, exactly. Uh, But researchers at Tel Aviv University recently discovered that when at least one species communicates, it gets very specific. Egyptian (laughs) fruit bats, it turns out, aren't just making high-pitched squeals when they gather together in their roosts. They're communicating specific problems, reports Bob Yerka at viz.org. Are you fucking serious, According to Ramin Skipper at Nature, neuroecologist... Yossi Yovul and his colleagues recorded a group of 22 Egyptian fruit bats for 75 days. Using a modified machine learning algorithm originally designed for recognising human voices, they fed 15,000 calls into the software. They then analysed the corresponding video to see if they could match the calls to certain activities. They found that the bat noises are not just random, (coughs) motorcycle, as previously thought, reports Skiba. They were able to classify 60% of the calls into four categories. Okay, so there are four categories the bats are arguing about, Chris. What do you think these categories are? If you're a bat, what would you be arguing about? Um, So obviously there's don't touch my fruit. Um, That's number one. (laughs) Yeah, okay, sure. Get off my branch, Jeremy, you shit stain. That's number two. That's number two, sure. Um, So... I'm not sure what else bats would have to go on. Maybe, like, one of them was, like, I really enjoyed 13 Reasons Why, and then all of the others were trying to explain why that was problematic. Exactly, right. He just won't listen, and they're all getting really, (laughs) really frustrated about it. Um, So that's three... That makes makes sense. (laughs) That's three things. Um, And then the last one is just, like, who's going to win the big game? And they're just having a big fight about that. Absolutely, because bats just love following the big game. Well, they are drawn to the bright lights of the big game, so, like... <laughs> yeah, I, we're not being specific about what sport here. Actually, bats can't see, so they're absolutely <laughs> not drawn to the bright lights of the big game. I don't know. I don't What's... think... Yeah, I don't think bats watch the big game. What are the actual ones? Well, so firstly, they found that the bat noises are not just random, blah, 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 blah. Okay. One of the call types indicates the bats are arguing about food. So you were okay, correct. So I, kind one of out with of four. The, one out of four. Another indicates a dispute about their positions within the sleeping cluster. Two out of four. So you were kind of close. A third I think call, that's, uh, that's a bit um, rude to me. I think I was right on the fucking money. You were right Allison. on the money. But you were saying get off my branch when in reality it's like they're all bunched together in a cluster of bats and it's more like... Oi, Jeremy, I told you not to sleep next to me anymore. You've got to go over the other side of the cluster. Jeremy, I want to sleep next to Charlotte. I talked to you about this. We have cool chemistry, and I want to see if there's anything there. You're blocking my... You 
cock blocking me, Jeremy. God, stop. I want to sleep between Charlotte, Gregory, Tim, and Maria. You've got to go sleep over there. You're in the <laughs> middle of the cluster. I want to be in the middle of the cluster this time. Oh my God. Jim, no, everyone knows that Charlotte and Gregory are the warmest. I know why you want to be in the middle of them. I want that spot. <laughs> That's me. I, I called that spot today. I called shotgun. Don't step to me, Jeremy. I'll fight you. <laughs> A third call is reserved for males making unwanted mating advances. Which, okay. I mean, you did say one of the calls was don't touch my fruit. So I feel like perhaps that is what. The bat oh, is saying fruit as a lewd metaphor. Okay, well, maybe yes. that's what that's what bats could have that slang. Okay, we don't know. That's true. That's true. Don't touch um, my fruit. Well, I mean, fucking typical, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and oh yeah, making unwanted advances. And the fourth happens when a bat argues with another bat sitting too close. Yes. So yes, <laughs> there is, is ba- get away get away from me. I love it. <laughs> this is the most relatable one. <laughs> So you're a bat, you're just hanging out and like a bat comes close to you and you're like, get the fuck away from me. I Stop love standing so close. There's only unwanted sexual advances. Like male <laughs> bats have no swag and no game and it's Absolutely. never wanted. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a These miracle. are the four categories they're talking about. You don't see wanted advances in this category. <laughs> and I like that what unwanted advances comes right before get the fuck away from me. Because that just, it all seems quite connected. Yeah, basically. Basically. Oh, dear. In so fact, bats, are, bats are just like us is what I've learned from this bats today. Bats are very relatable creatures. Mm. <laughs> Arguing about food. Uh, rejecting sexual advances. Not wanting people to stand too close to them. I mean, it's pretty relatable material. Exactly. So I'm going to keep reading a little bit more. In fact, the bats make slightly different versions of the calls when speaking to different individuals within the group. Oh, shit. Similar to humans using a different tone of voice when talking to different people. (laughs) So there's probably one bat in the group that all the bats just talk in this really condescending tone of voice to. Because they know he's a bit of an idiot. He's the, I guess, the black sheep of the bats. I'm not sure what that would be. <laughs> no, I'm not <laughs> sure either. I'm not sure either. The but white they just, bat. Yeah, they just really think he's a bit of a dummy. They're like, oh, Jim, do you think you could, like, scooch over a bit, mate? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, Jim. Jim, you want to scooch over just, like, a little bit, Jim? Just a tad, Jim. Jim, I don't think she's interested in your sexual advances, so <laughs> maybe maybe you should not touch her fruit. And then everybody's like, you know, Jim, just uh, FYI, we shouldn't have to tell you about that. Um, <laughs> I know I know this stuff's all a little bit confusing, but um, just be, be fucking cool for a second, Jim. If that's, just uh, don't be a fucking douchebag, mate. Jim, if you could just keep your shit together for, like, a second... That would be awesome. <laughs> Just keep it in your pants, mate. Look, I know we don't have pants, but it's, it's a matter of speech. Keep it under your fur, Jim. <laughs> um, yeah, and then... We've, Jim, we've, we've all seen it. It's not impressive. If you could just keep it under there, that would be... Um, it's, we don't need to see it again. Um, We're all in this cluster, we mate. We've all seen everything that everyone has to offer. So if she says no, she says no. There's, there's no... Um, <laughs> Is there more to this article? Uh, look, there's just a lot more information about this research and about how it was done and all that kind of stuff. And look, uh, we don't need to get into that. If you're interested, go on the Smithsonian Mag and support this uh, research, which is also appearing in many scientific reports. If you're interested in reading scientific papers, personally, I'm just fascinated by the concept of bats having little arguments. And bats, yeah. you know, that's very good to me. I think that dogs, when they talk, they just say hi. Like, there's literally nothing hi. else. It's just like, hi. 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 Hello. Hi. Yeah, and wolves as well, by extension. They're just screaming yeah. it. Hi. Oi. No, I think they're like Pokemon, and they say their own names. So <laughs> so all the wolves are called, like, Aru or something. Yes. Aru. Aru. But it sound, to wolves, it sounds super different. Like, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's just like saying Graham, but we hear oh. 
Um, can I bring you a story from Ten Daily? Okay, of um, course. This is written by Alex Bruce Smith, who's a cool reporter. Oh, she's interviewed um, me for a story before. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, she's um, a pretty sick gal. Yeah. Um, Queensland Council investigating conduct of Bachelorette contestant <laughs> Jess Glasgow. I will admit I had this story in my lineup as well. But you know more about <laughs> so The Bachelor, good. so I feel like it's more appropriate that you introduce this one. Bachelorette contestant Jess Glasgow is being investigated over conduct allegations following the season's premiere, his employer has confirmed. <laughs> Glas- oh, no. Why did this guy think this was a good idea? <laughs> just, I'll let so you continue dumb. with the story, but I just... Not one part yeah. of me can understand why this was a good idea. Glasgow, who works in local government in Queensland, is being investigated for an alleged breach of conduct following Wednesday night's episode. His appearance on Angie Kent's season of The Bachelorette, which aired on Network 10, was uncomfortable viewing. Yeah. Well, there... While there was nothing overtly malicious in Glasgow's actions, his on-screen behaviour towards Angie and attitude prompted both Angie and fellow contestants to express their concerns. (laughs) I, I, I can see that. In one instance, Glasgow presented Angie with keys to his apartment, but said she would have to work for his home address. Which... Yikes! ...is wild. Um, but I also quite like the idea of giving someone a key and not telling them where it's for, so they just have to try lots of different They just go to every single house in your town and try the key. Yeah. They'll be like, I'll tell you what suburb it is, the rest is up to you. Although, to be fair, she'd probably just need to go to his hometown and look for the one that still has, like, the election banners up of his own face That's from when there true. was the local council elections, because I feel like this guy is probably the kind of guy who will leave up his, like, election banners on his home. Um, he was also at the centre of a drama when he was filmed allegedly telling other contestants he wouldn't accept Angie's special rose. Um, I love the world of The Bachelor. I don't know what, what is, is it? Like, Can you explain what the special rose is? Um, basically, I haven't actually watched this season, but traditionally the idea is um, every episode everyone has to get given a rose and those people who don't get given a rose go home. Um, so, like, that's how you stay on. So... Um, most of the time people will be given it at like the rose ceremony, but some people will be given one like before that on a date or something like that. And that's the special rose, is it? Kind of. On the first night, there's called, (laughs) in the American series anyway, there's something called the first impression rose. So that's where, um, it's like the guy who she's like, oh yeah, this guy can get it. This Um, guy. The guy who was a fireman and walked in with the puppy. Like that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, historically that guy wins the bachelorette so like (laughs) well there was literally that guy on the season um i don't believe he was given angie's special rose oh that's a shame well Um, she made a wrong choice then glasgow who is an elected councillor in the shire of noosa (laughs) in the sunshine coast which is fucking amazing um will now be the subject of an investment It will be the subject of an investigation by the Office of the Independent Assessor, the council has confirmed. What I love about this is they're not investigating any of his, like, professional conduct. They're just investigating if he's too much of a douchebag on TV to be allowed to be a councillor anymore. (laughs) Well, I think in the next episode he got out, if I'm following the Twitter drama correctly, because he did make some very, like, lewd, lewd actions towards The Bachelorette. Well, that's just not acceptable. Which is very unacceptable. But also, like, this guy... And also, on... no no councillor has ever done anything lewd no, or inappropriate. No, politician ever has done that. Absolutely not. But I just, like, I'm baffled at what this guy's thought process was. Because, I mean, he said that he wants to become the mayor of Noosa. You know, that's his ultimate goal. To well, I think become the mayor I think he's trying some... to take the the Trump approach to politics, where he's not playing by the not playing by not the rules playing anymore, by the man. rules, and the voters um, of Noosa are going to lick that shit up because they've watched the Bachelorette and they're like, no, he, this guy's real because he went on the Bachelorette. Yeah, um, but the then famously like, okay, authentic so show, the Bachelorette. You want to go on a reality show to like, you know, boost your cred or whatever, so you can become the Noosa Shire mayor. 
But then you proceed to be like just a straight up douchebag. And also, I don't see why <laughs> of all of the possible reality shows you would pick The Bachelorette. No, you've got like because... Survivor or something. Because yeah, on like Survivor, the it's, just it's shows okay your to be conniving. To convince someone to sleep with you or marry you, sure. and that's not a useful skill for a counselor yeah. to have, as far as I'm aware. And it's I not feel the job like description. on Survivor, if you want to be a douche hmm. and like, you know, make everyone I... hate you, that's kind of part of the game. People will yeah, like that, that to me survivor. shows that you're good at politics. Like you yeah. can get bills passed, you can get Absolutely. shit through if you are good at Survivor. And if you like are the person who's kind of like you're part of one group, but then you manage to like oust the leader of the group that you're part of by convincing people to vote for them on the, you know, whatever the eviction night is, then you know what? You deserve to be mayor. You've shown your skill at politicking. Um, Noosa Mayor Tony Wellington has confirmed he will refer Glasgow to the assessor, saying no his shit. behaviour on The Bachelorette was not reflective of the council or Noosa community values. I mean, which is inaccurate about Noosa community yeah, values. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway. Um, Councillor Glasgow did not seek approval from myself, and I only found out about his involvement after the show had been recorded. <laughs> oh, my God. So, so this he just guy did just it. like he didn't tell oh, anybody he was doing it. Oh, they I'm just gonna found go on like a Twitter or something. I'm gonna like go that. on like a family holiday, yeah. So I'll be away for a few weeks, and the mayor's like, "Oh, okay, <laughs> just uh, yeah, no worries, mate. Enjoy your holiday." And then he comes back, and, and he's like, "Yo, you will never guess what I did? I was on the Bachelorette." He's like, "Yeah, we fucking know, <laughs> Glasgow. We've all we've all seen it. We've all seen it now. It was rough." <laughs> um, Wellington added that while Glasgow was not representing Noosa Council on the program, which would be hilarious, he was... <laughs> he was looking to win Angie Kent's love for the entire Noosa Council. Exactly. Well, I, I mean, would that not be better than marrying one person is marrying however many people well, live in like Noosa? A, get, if you like get a like, plural a marriage, divorce from all of them, think about <laughs> how much money you'd make out It's of like that. a plural marriage, but kind of working the other way, because usually it's like the man who is yeah. then asking a lot of women to marry him. In this case, it's a, a whole conglomerate of people asking one woman to marry them. So she's married to all of them, but they're not married to each other. No. Um, the, so she does have to make time is for all of them, which is going to be challenging logistically. Yeah. Um, she'll, she'll see... Well, I don't know how many people live in Noosa, but I'm going to estimate at least five digits worth. Sure. Um, There's at least a few people. At least a few people. So uh, she's going to have to spend more than one of them per day and per night. Like, realistically, if you did one a day, that's only 365. So, like, yeah, that's she's going to have to mm. do group dates, which The Bachelor will train her for. So, Well, that's true. It, she's getting ready for her marriage to the entirety of Noosa. Or just the Noosa Council. Um, while he was not representing Noosa Council on the program, he was... Aware that his occupation as a counsellor was frequently referred to on the show. <laughs> so he, he did not um, make this quiet. Um, oh, I just... What a weird thing to do. <laughs> because here's the thing. He's gone on the show. He's ruined his career in politics because of that. But also he's not had a successful reality TV career because at least... If you ruined your political career, but you were, like, the cool guy that everyone liked, you could maybe be, like, the next Bachelor in the next season and then start a career. Yeah. That's you know, start a reality honestly, TV. Like, that, you, I think, is honestly the end goal for most of the people who go on The Bachelor is to become the next Bachelor, is to come sure, second. absolutely. And then you keep getting seasons in other shows, then you go on Love Island, whatever. But when yeah, you become... Good, it's great fun. When you're the villain of the series, I don't think those opportunities are open to you, unfortunately. I will say this, actually. Um, there was recently the villain in... This is going to be Chris's Bachelorette... Um, Chris's Bachelor Minute. Um, okay. The villain in one of the US series is recently was a woman named Demi, who okay. was villain, I think, more through the edit than anything else and the fact that she was, like, extra and kind of batshit crazy. Um <laughs> But right, she then sure. went on Bachelor in Paradise and became the first person on any of those shows to have a like a same sex relationship on the show. So like oh, she right. went from being villain to being like universally loved by everybody. Sure. So like she did redemption very well for herself. Well, yeah. the council knows what he's got to do. <laughs> 
Now, to be fair, this is a same-sex relationship between two attractive blonde women. Well, that's true. So, like, it's not really, it's not pushing the envelope as much as it thinks that it is. No, I mean, there's probably a lot of, uh, probably a lot of male viewers who may have been forced to watch the show against their will who were very into that. Well, they are honestly the cutest couple on that season. I'm like, sure they're they the were. Ones who, I'm sure they're the only <laughs> ones that I believe won't like kill each other at some point. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I think the batch, the concept of the Bachelor and the Bachelorette is kind of wild enough. But I kind of feel like the Bachelor in Paradise and Love Island and those kind of shows are kind of like next level because instead of vying for the love of one person, you're vying for like the love of a lot of people and then you have to immediately match up with someone and be like yeah this is my one if you want to stay on the show i enjoy it because it's like even more gamified than the regular (laughs) bachelor um but the regular bachelor is also very gamified and also bachelor in paradise tends to just get kind of exhausting after a while so too many too many characters too many arts anyway I've talked about The Bachelor for too long. Do you have a story for me, please, Alison? Well, how about we go on a story on a similar vein, actually? Okay. And you've probably read this story, but let's bring it onto the table. Uh, my, my intern, Anna, shared this one to me. Anna, who is now up to date and is following along week to week, which is very oh exciting for her because she gets this content hot and fresh now. Congratulations, Anna. Congratulations on listening to over 60 hours of us talking bullshit on a podcast within a couple of months you must be very proud (laughs) i was playing um like a online game with someone like a friend last night and she invited one of her friends on who i had not talked to before and he ended up asking about the laura mentioned the podcast so he ended up asking about it and he looked it up and his first response was like wow there's um there's a lot of it yeah um (laughs) there's a lot of hours here there sure is buddy yeah Oh, we have a new listener, so that's something. Well, there you go. That's one new person. See, that's yeah. what I think I need to do. I think I need to go back on all the online games I used to be addicted to as a teen and promote the podcast exclusively because people absolutely don't hate it when you self-promote on, like, well, any no, platform. Well, no, what you need is a wingman, like my A wingman friend. to drop <laughs> So they can mention the like, podcast, oh, and then the other no. person's like, oh, what's this podcast about? And then you start talking oh, about it. Oh, you mentioned it. Oh, what a shame. But here's the spiel I've prepared. <laughs> so anyway, this was a story sent to me by Anna. And yep. yeah, it's kind of in the same vein of The Bachelor. Uh, I'm reading from the New Zealand Herald. And it says, male cat needs glucose strip after mating with five females in one night in pet hotel. Damn, son. <laughs> Damn, Damn, son. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this that's cat, a trooper. This cat, oh my God. really. And the picture is just the best picture. It's the cat in question, out cold, looking... <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, a close up of the face of the cat and he's got his mouth open a little bit with his little teeth sticking out and he's out cold. He's just There was a um an article I once read. It was like someone interviewing the rapper ASAP Rocky mm-hmm. where he was asking what he did before and he said um he slept with nine women and then the guy's like wait what like nine all at the same time and he's like no of course not three sets of three oh jeez and, the inter- and then the interviewer was like and it was at this point i realized just how different our lives were and I was like, <laughs> yes no shit <laughs> uh, i'm gonna keep keep reading into this story a little bit more uh yeah. it's a a male cat has been left needing a glucose strip after it mailed with at least five females in one night when he was let out of his cage by pet hotel staff. Who let this boy out of his cage? <laughs> this incredibly horny cat out of his cage. <laughs> what? This cat is never allowed out of his cage again. By the third time, it must have just been puffs of dust coming out. Like, the, I don't understand. This physically... No. I don't know. This, this, this boy, this boy... Really... By, by the third time, he was, like, going at it, and then he was just like, I'm sorry, I don't think this is going to happen. I, it's not you. I've just, I've just also had sex two times in the last hour, and I don't think my body... And then he, he tries two more times after that. He's a real... He's committed, I'll give him he that. He really is very committed. 
Uh, CRP, a Russian blue, was left at the pet hotel by his owners, Mr. and Mrs. Zhao, in Guangdong province in South China. Mr. Zhao said he had specifically told the business that Zhao Pi had not been neutered. I thought they'd be professional, but the staff member didn't <laughs> feed Zhao Pi during the day and let him roam freely at night, the cat owner posted on social media. That's right, all the cats were free to walk around the shop and then the employee went home. Why? Like, what is this? So they've just <laughs> essentially built a cat orgy and or cage match here. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's so wild. The, the owner's like... <laughs> Look, I, I need to tell you, my cat is incredibly randy, okay? This is an extremely you've gotta, horny you've cat. You've got to understand <laughs> gotta be prepared. that this boy cannot be around the ladies, okay? But no, and they also just... the ladies, the ladies can't be around him because they find him irresistible. The, he just the has ladies a charm. are really into him, very into him. But he looks like Ryan Gosling as a cat. <laughs> he can't be trusted. Absolutely. Uh, so it continues between Do you around. This cat has like abs. <laughs> Do you think it's like ripped? Well, unfortunately, the photo is cut off, so we can only see the cat's. Oh no! There's another photo later down, where the cat is like laying down on its back with its belly up. I can't see any abs, but maybe that's because the cat has fur. If we maybe shave that like a, fur off. Maybe it's like a twink, a twink sort of cat. Like, that works for some people. I don't... Yeah, like, some people are into yeah. that. A lot of uh, options. <laughs> Zhao claims that the pet hotel then blamed him for the incident and complained that some of the cat owners weren't planning on having kittens. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... It's like if you, you, a bunch of high schoolers go on a school camp and one of them yeah. has sex with five of them and those five will get pregnant. Yeah. Whose fault is that? Is that the fault of the high schooler in question, the parent of the high schooler in question, or the the camp counsellor who let that be, like, happen? <laughs> in, in this case, we have to realise that basically what happened was the camp counsellor let all of the teenagers out all night, left them out, and then went home. That's true. So didn't feed the teenagers, <laughs> left them all in a big room together, exactly. and unsupervised, and was shocked. That and then was like, "Oh, I'm, I'm going out for to... a while now." They they dared to make love. And um, look, the, the parent how... before the parent before the incidents went down said, "Look, you have to understand." My child is incredibly hormonal right now, so... Kevin's going through some changes, and Ke- we hear some horrible sounds at night from Kevin's room. I don't trust him around all of these other teens. And then the owner's like... Not the owner. The camp counsellor is like... <laughs> <laughs> the camp counsellor's like, no worries, no worries. They've got individual rooms. It'll all be okay. And then as soon as the parents <laughs> leave, all the kids are... <laughs> as though that's going to be a positive thing. <laughs> Like, anyway, the, the owner continues. Uh, he said, they have the nerve to be upset with me. They wanted me to explain the situation to all the other owners. My fucking cat is exhausted and on a glucose strip, and this is my fault? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> oh, fuck. I think everybody's kind of at fault here. I feel like the... <laughs> Owner, obviously, because he should have, A, fed the cat before he let it do its nasty deeds. Yeah. Um, I feel like the... Or told the, they... or told the cat, look, if you're going to do this, you've got to drink some Powerade between <laughs> sessions. <laughs> you've got to really have your electrolytes. It's really Absolutely. Important. Keep your glucose and electrolytes up, mate. And then have fun. Stay safe, um, is though. There, is there much more to this story? Um... Oh. Not really. Because that's, just... actually, that's actually a very nice segue into a story that I have. Okay, yeah, well, um, let's, le- let's leave that there. Um, so this is a story that I found in my perusing the Apple News Plus service. Um, yeah, this sure. Comes from, this comes from Fast Company. Okay. Um, the headline is, Cheers at the Finish Line. Athletes are flocking to Superfest and other new performance beers. Okay. Um... Myrna Valero would not describe herself as a beer person. The ultra runner is more of a Cabernet Sauvignon drinker. (sighs) But the beer cravings do a kick in occasionally, namely after a long day on the trail. 
Over the summer, for instance, Valerio completed the Broken Arrow Sky Race, which involved running 26 kilometers nearly straight uphill in California's Sierra Nevada, trudging through snow and scrambling up rocks, she said. That sounds a... <laughs> somewhat unsafe, <laughs> but, you know, who am I to judge? Let Myrna do what she wants to do. Yeah, well, um, you know, each to their it w- own. It was a challenge that merited something cool and celebratory at the end. Happily, there was a cold can waiting for each of the roughly 3,000 runners. <laughs> <laughs> a pale ale made by Superfest. There's just punched... a beer at the top of the mountain. <laughs> yes. It sounds like a commercial. It's wild. It, um, it probably is a commercial. Well, that is fair, actually. I guess the sponsorship <laughs> is a commercial inherently. They're like, um, look, we need the beer to be at the top of the mountain. And then they, when they're drinking it, they need to show the label. Um, for years, beer and running have been closer exercise buddies than you might think. Marathon bibs, marathon bibs often come with tickets you can trade in for a brew after crossing the finish line. Running clubs often end their treks at a bar, and local microbreweries hand out IPAs at the end of a race. Hmm. But with Superfest, runners have someone. Um, runners now have someone from within the community addressing their needs. Superfest was created in San Francisco in 2006 by Caitlin Lanzberg, who wanted to make a beer that would work with trail runners like herself after grueling training <laughs> sessions, often called Superfests. The brewery's um, KFT, okay. or no, the brewery's FKT, or Fastest Known Time Pale Ale, for instance. <laughs> I really has, like reading, I really like hearing content about subcultures that I just absolutely have no idea about, you know, know like right? about the subcultures culture. Like we learned last week about lawnmower racing and what the subculture of that is. Right now I'm learning about people who enjoy running up mountains and drinking beer. I mean, um, sure. It's, it's incredibly German. Um, the, <laughs> well, that's for true. For instance, has a 5.5 percent alcohol by volume and is low in gluten like all of superfest beers and is brewed with black currant and salt to supply the electrolytes and sugars that runners <laughs> typically cram at the end of a race <laughs> um, so they're making like an alcoholic sports drink essentially that is what this so is so basically yes. what, pal- I, what i'm getting from this they're making an alcoholic sports drink so basically they're stealing mac and charlie from always sunny's idea about fight milk and taking the milk part out Yes, and that the made eggs. fight. I guess fight beer, fight, um, but that well, is what maybe this like is. fight black currant juice. Fight black currant juice. I love it. Um, <laughs> apparently, this has been extremely successful. Oh jeez. <laughs> well, you got to find a market and really sell to them. And like, you're like, look, this is a electro- electrolyte replenishing beer that you can drink mm. at the top of the mountain that you've just run up. With access to its new parent district parent company's distribution and production network, Sierra Nevada makes more than one million barrels of beer per year and distributes widely across the country. That's quite a lot. Superfest is poised for a healthy future. Um, So this cat really should have had a couple of these brewskis in between sessions. Yeah, had a couple of brews. And look, the owner should have been responsible for supplying those brews to the cat, knowing Um, the cat's tendencies. I will say, though, that I think that only giving this to people after the race, that seems lazy to me. I think this should be, like, we need to replace... I want to go to a gym where their, like, bubblers are sponsored by Superfest. So, like, you just fill your water bottle up with this in between, like, pump and iron. Because I very much enjoy this idea of all of these incredibly large roided up gym bros slowly getting drunker as they do their exercise. Because inevitably... (laughs) they're going to start a fight at some point and all kill each other. And oh, I think this absolutely. is going to be a very effective way of culling the species <laughs> from the, the large men who scare me on the street. Yeah, um, well, uh, I guess Instagram will suffer without those gym bros. Well, how, I guess it's a sacrifice The only way I'm going to become an influencer, Alison, is if I get rid of the big boys. So well, you've got to I kill need... off the bigger ones so then, like, the not big boys can become influencers. Yeah, so I'm trying to sort of engineer gladiatorial matches inside of gyms. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Just supplying them with a lot of alcohol. Yeah, look, I respect uh, that. Yeah. Um, so this, I'm going to assume, is... Fast Company is obviously about, like, brands and shit like that. So yeah, I, sure. I don't know if this is sponsored content or if this is just how it works. I'm not one of their writers. But 
I just love this idea of alcoholic sports drink. It's I guess it's probably like the whole point of it is to talk about business things. And so I guess naturally mm. part of talking about business is that it sounds a little bit like SponCon. Exactly. Um, can I, I don't want to tell you about another story. I just want to tell you about the funniest headline I've ever seen. Okay. Um, is it also from this, Fast Company? No, this is from a magazine called Truck Trend. Truck Trend. Very and cool. The, he- the headline is, I won a truck! Exclamation <laughs> point. <laughs> And that's sure. all I want. The article itself is extremely boring, but I run. I won a truck is the best headline I've ever seen. Uh, is the article about him winning a truck, I guess? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, well, there it's you just go. about how this guy won a truck. And, you know, good for him. Sure. Um, I'm very happy for him. Yeah, good on him. Congratulations you on your truck. Uh, yeah. I feel like we've got time for one more each because well, the this recording is, has a lot of editing that I have to do at the start. There's a to get lot of, of problems the in the bullshit. audio today. Yeah. Um, look, this isn't too much to this story, and it's quite a, it's a wholesome story in some ways, but it's also a horrifying story in some ways. Yes. Uh, and I'm reading from the Illawarra Mercury, and okay. it says, well, Illawarra newborn Remy Francis weigh above average at 5.88 kilograms. This is by that, Lisa Washmuth. That's, uh, that's a chunk of a baby. That's a that's hefty a, baby, Chris. That's a real spherical baby there. The, and the, uh, the picture uh, that's at the top of the article, we can see the, the hefty girl laying hmm. down and looking like a newborn, but she also kind of resembles the rock. In terms of <laughs> <laughs> She's just fucking it's it's not fat, it's all muscle. It's all this pure baby, muscle. Yes, girl. This baby did so many crunches in the womb. Absolutely. Which, she was just the whole time. She was just I feel like lifting. I I wasted my gestation period by Absolutely. not getting fucking yoked. You've got to get swole in the womb. You've got to start early. This is the, where capitalism has brought society is if you want a career in bodybuilding, you've got to start before birth. Exactly. If you haven't done exactly. that, it's not going to happen And so your mom you. has to, like, you know, drink exclusively protein shakes so that protein can go to you in the womb so that you can you're, get swole. You're not supposed to drink when you're on... Um, when you're pregnant, but if you do drink the electrolyte beer, that will actually work as That's well. That's okay. Yeah, it will help your baby get swell. So, I mean, congratulations to this couple, um, but also, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry that you poor body that had to <laughs> endure that. <laughs> that you had this girl. This I'm sure the baby's lovely. She's going to grow up to be a lovely girl. But imagine having like an almost six kilogram human being inside your body. You'd, she'd feel so much lighter now. <laughs> she and that'd be something. absolutely would. That would be, like, you'd feel like you were walking on air. But I'm going to read she this. Hadn't, <laughs> if she hadn't surely destroyed her um, whole zone, which I feel is likely, she'd be, like, skipping through the street. Yeah. I From the story, she had a C-section. And look, oh, I, res- fine. I respect that decision very yeah. much. If she had had the baby the regular way, she... Would have had some problems, I feel like. There may have been a couple of issues with a six kilogram human being exiting from that area. So It's not designed for that. (laughs) Mount Warrigal couple, Emma and Daniel Miller, knew their baby wouldn't be on the uh, sorry, knew their baby would be on the larger side, but didn't expect to welcome a five point eight eight kilogram bundle of joy this week. The average birth weight (laughs) bundle of just mass. (laughs) <laughs> bundle of mass. The average birth weight of babies in Australia is 3.3 kilograms. So Remy Francis Miller... This is more than double. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy. Almost double. Oh, wait, Actually, less. Fuck, I can't do math. Yeah. Wow, that's Well, it says the baby is 7.2 LBs is the average. So Remy, the baby, that, the baby in question, is 12.9 LBs. Damn, is, Remy. Remy is certainly above average. Poor <laughs> Remy. <laughs> You're a big gal. The healthy bub came into the world at Wollongong Hospital on Monday at 38 weeks and two days via emergency caesarean. Miss Miller, 27, said her size was a surprise. 
She's like a mini sumo wrestler, she said. <laughs> oh, that sounds so cute. <laughs> <laughs> she does sound so cute. The baby is adorable. Look, oh. I'm not necessarily a baby person, but this baby is very cute, the chonky baby. Oh. I guess that's I the it. trade-off. That's the trade-off. I did that's expect true. to have a larger baby, as I had gestational diabetes, but not this big. At 35 weeks, an ultrasound revealed she was about 4 kilograms, but we didn't think she'd grow much more. So, sorry, the baby was born at 38 weeks, right? At Hmm. 35 weeks, she was 4 kilograms. This baby packed on 1.88 kilograms of solid mass (laughs) in in three three weeks. weeks. (laughs) That's some really impressive shit. Like, bodybuilders can't do that. This I could do that if I ate a lot some... of tacos, but, like, I don't think that's the right kind of mass. Like, this baby's just, like, my God, that's really impressive. This baby is tacked on a lot of mass, and this baby is going to be swole. And that's, that's impressive. So... This baby's going to kill people with its bare <laughs> hands, and I think that that's... The baby deserves that power, it's not it? She's Look, like... it's going to be one of those clickbait stories that's at the bottom of, like, you know, kind of dodgy links that you go to, and it's going to say... This baby packed on almost two kilos in three weeks. You will never believe its <laughs> secret. And that will be, you know, about drinking protein shakes. Your mother drinking protein shakes while you're in the womb is the best way to get swole. That's how it will go into that. And it will be sponsored content, of course. Yeah. Well, that's the only way to become an influencer these days is to have a really buff baby. Absolutely. <laughs> a really swole girl. Uh, so look, the mum, the mum had other babies. She said, it shouldn't have come as too much of a shock to the proud new parents whose daughter, Willow, now two, weighed 5.5 kilograms at birth. They also have a four-year-old son, Ace, who weighed 3.8 kilograms at birth. Poor Ace is like the runt of the family, hey? As far as newborns uh, go. Poor kid. Poor kid. Yeah, his two, his two sisters are a lot more swole than he was in the womb. I guess, Ace is like, going to be bullied mercilessly. <laughs> like, I guess as the children grow, right, their size will balance out. But everyone's going to know now, everyone who's read this article in the Illawarra region is going to know that Ace was a small baby. And they're going to I'm, feel so embarrassed for him that he was a small baby. I'm sorry, Ace. You well, he's still larger than average baby, but he's smaller That's not than good his enough, sisters Allison. as we a newborn. <laughs> Second place is basically last place. Everybody knows Yeah, that. and in this case, he's got third place of his family in terms of baby size, which... I don't, I don't even want to talk to him. It's That's not ideal nothing. for him. It's not ideal. I mean, like, for all we know, he could grow up to become a super world-famous bodybuilder, but he'll always carry the burden of being a slightly, average, slightly larger than average size newborn, whilst his sister was <laughs> a swole as heck newborn. Um, can I give you... The wildest story that I've read in Absolutely. quite some time. Um, this is from a magazine called Town and Country. Okay. Um, the headline is A Prison Etiquette Guide. Okay. The, em- the Emily Post of Prison, a white collar criminal's guide to behind the bars etiquette. There are rules so- for this sorry? sort of thing. Who is yes. this article a- aimed towards? White collar workers who are going to prison. <laughs> I have no fucking idea. It is the wildest shit that this okay. exists. I'm I'm keen. I wanna I wanna know. So, you got caught. That porn star <laughs> wasn't about to pay herself to stay mum about her night with your boss, so you stepped up and took one for the team. Or perhaps your daughters this, were better at Instagram happen? than calculus, so you spent half a million bucks pretending they were the best college athletic prospects since OJ Simpson. Well, that did happen. Or That's true. Maybe the SEC decided you were less of a crypto guru and more of a charlatan. Well, that's also true. From Laurie Laughlin to Michael Cohen, nearly every day brings a notable figure face-to-face with a possible jail sentence, which in turn <laughs> has given rise to a cottage industry, the prison consultancy. Oh, my For- God. <laughs> Imagine being so white-collar. Or so Silicon Valley that you hire a consultant before you go to prison to learn about this prison culture. Fucking exists though, is it? Like, <laughs> it's wild. 
<laughs> from companies like California's White Collar Advice, which boasts a team of professionals with penal experience as convicts <laughs> or as employees of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Jeez. To in- individual entrepreneurs like Federal Prison Handbook author Christopher Zukis, they have made positively de rigueur for the more- those more accustomed to sleeping between the Prosetti than a polyester to hire an insider who will lay out what to expect when expecting to be incarcerated. <laughs> They charge thousands for their advice and some six figures for help managing your affairs while you're inside. Okay. But I respect the people kind of grifting the grifters, the white collar grifters who are going to prison, right? I respect the people who are grifting those grifters. This is so delightful. (laughs) It's so Um, wild. But we rounded up some of the top consultants as well as some high profile prisoners to ask for their most crucial insights because <laughs> you know you never know oh dear um what, f- number 1 where exactly are you going there are ex- essentially two answers to this question camp and prison if this was your first bust <laughs> and your crime wasn't violent chances are you won't be going to prison you'll be headed to one of 76 minimum security institutions, six of which are federal prison camps, the majority of the rest being satellite minimum security camps because of the, on the grounds of larger high security prisons. Because yeah, of this the is where they put all the white people, I'm guessing. Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> be- because of the on-site amenities and activities, FPCs are generally considered much more desirable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sure. There is a vast gulf in quality of life between a camp and any prison. Camps are often called country club prisons or club fed. <laughs> Fucking hell. Um, oh, club so, fed. True. Like, a scornful appellation applied to places like Southern California's Low Camp Federal Prison Camp, where 80s Wall Street villain Ivan Bosky spent his afternoons playing tennis on lush grounds unencumbered by barbed wire. Um... <laughs> Oh, dear. Um, So, number two. Mind your manners. Pay close attention to the boundaries inside. Don't ear hustle, says Jennifer Myers, who served her time for interstate marijuana trafficking at Alderson and is now a white-collar advice consultant. Ear hustling is listening to other people's conversations, which might fly among the tightly spaced tables at Le Grinoir, but not here. Um, so it's eavesdropping, it's ear hustling. Exactly. Um, sure. So no she eavesdropping? Also, she also advises that you need to be very aware of other people's space. Even after you've been assigned a bunk, never, ever start moving your things in without an introduction. Even if you've been assigned to that still, you're still invading someone's living space. Instead, walk up to the door, leave your stuff outside, knock and say, Hi, I'm your new cellmate. <laughs> I don't know why, but just the idea of someone doing that is inherently funny. Um, also, my favourite I don't bit. know the culture of, like, I've never been to prison. No, but neither have I. Look, I also don't know the difference in... Well, obviously, there's a vast difference in culture between club fed and, like, the prisons that we see on television. But I just imagining, like, a hard, a hard, you know... Hard time, not club fed. Someone knocking on the door to like the cell, and there's all these like really hardened criminals in there, and it's just like, "Hey guys, I'm your new cellmate." <laughs> you guys excited <laughs> to spend the next few years together? Oh my um, gosh, I'm so happy to be here, gals. Just let me move in. Just wait a second. Which bed is mine? I called it's on top bunk. Oh, sorry, you have top. Oh, you you have. Oh, um, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, 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 okay. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 yeah. Um, next piece of advice is be polite to the staff, but not friendly. He says, inmates <laughs> particularly dislike other inmates who suck up to the staff. Well, that's if you're true. Perce- if you're perceived that way, you'll be shunned, labelled a bootlicker, and even suspected of being a prison snitch, a particularly despised type. Yeah, Number fair three, enough. On the menu, make sure to hit all your favourite restaurants, Michael Cohen style, before heading to prison. <laughs> <laughs> because camps okay. are not renowned for gourmet fare or paleo-friendly options. Oh, d- I, <laughs> imagine going to it, prison and asking for paleo food. 
It's, I guess, akin to an Applebee's, but maybe not as nice, says Ingrid O'Kun, who was once a top executive at Tiffany & Co., but pleaded guilty in 2013 to stealing and fencing $2.1 million in jewels while working there. Jeez. She too works at White Collar Advice now. Um, and now for the fucking punchline. But I don't know, she adds, because I haven't ever been into an Applebee's. <laughs> Just like rich white collar grifter yeah. who was stealing from Tiffany's, who I'm assuming is probably white. I'm just assuming I, everyone involved in the story is white. Maybe I'm making surely. wrong assumptions, but um, it just but, sounds incredibly white. This whole idea. Forget about Gotham salads dressing on the side. Most camps don't even have a salad bar, though Alderson <gasps> does. <laughs> there no is one that salad does. Salad bar. Um, instead, you will encounter questionably fresh meat and cheap carb-rich meals that will undo every Barry's boot camp class you ever took. Disgusting! One Carbs lunch was in my pot- prison system? <laughs> One lunch was potato soup, two grilled cheese sandwiches, potato chips, and a donut. That sounds Myers pretty re- good, actually. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. That sounds Myers good. Recalls, I kind of want that lunch. I think I ate in the dining room maybe twice. Um, what did she eat the rest of the time? Un- um, okay, so... Unspecified. No, it says comedian Tommy Chong, who was incarcerated at Central California's Taft Correctional Institute for Trafficking in Marijuana Paraphernalia. His social group, known inside as a car, included PGA caddy Eric Lawson and the Wolf of Wall Street Jordan Belfort. Jesus we had a- <laughs> Christ! Yeah. The, we the had- Wolf of Wall Street! <laughs> that one, yeah. Um, oh, we had our own dear. private Goodfellas kitchen going. We used vegetables from the garden and buy chicken off other guys. Eric and I would make these incredible burritos using chili peppers he grew. Um, well, well okay. there you go. Okay. Respect. You respect that. Where did um, they get the chickens from, though? Unclear. (laughs) Unspecified, sure. Someone smuggled it in, yeah. Shopping, number four. You will be allowed to bring virtually nothing into the camp, save a soft cover Bible and eyeglasses. Um, Fake socialite and high-end grifter Anna Delvey was allowed to keep her signature Celine frames as New York's, at New York's infamous Rikers Island. Um, (laughs) She's she's wearing, like, fashionable glasses. So there's no no shopping in prison. Shocker. Well, that's um, well, that's a surprise to me because I assumed there would be shopping in prison. You thought there'd be like you'd be able to go down to Tiffany's, but no. Yeah, I thought I'd be able to go down to Tiffany's and steal more jewels to sell. In the loo, number five. Don't be embarrassed. Our experts revealed that logistical questions about the ahem accommodations in prison are at the top of most clients' list. That said, on this most private of matters, we will leave the details of your meeting with your consultant. I love that this <laughs> okay. is like sponsored content because they're like, this is the if thing you most people want to find out about how to shit to in prison. If you want to know about the deal with shitting, you have to pay us and we will tell you. Um, number six is living your best life. Um, so you've just got to well, really make the most of it. Well, if you want to live your best life, just don't then, squander no- your privilege. <laughs> Number seven, which I feel should be integrated into number six, is keep your chin up. Um, so this is a thing that exists. Which yeah, look, I've learned something today. The, yeah, there's a, a cottage industry of advisors for people going to now, white collar prison. I'm pretty sure there was a movie about Will Ferrell where he... Oh, yeah, shit, the some... one where he impl- made Kevin Hart do that because he thought yeah. he assumed because he was black he'd been to prison. Yeah, exactly. And then, but I think uh, in that movie, I don't know if Will Ferrell's character was going to Club Fed or if he was going to like a real prison. Real, real one. For doing I actually don't nasty. remember much about that movie except for the fact that it was quite annoying. But <laughs> it sounded, I haven't seen it, it looked bad. I um, did try it, I did attempt watching it on Netflix and I don't think I got that far into it. But basically, maybe, I don't know which came first, the movie or this industry. Because in that movie, like, it, it seemed like the industry didn't exist. I like the idea that they all watched that, what was it called, Get Hard? Was it that one? Get Hard, um, that's it. I like to believe that they, all these people watched Get Hard and thought, let's do that. We're let's make do that, that except real. let's curate it to be specifically advice 
for rich white folk going to club-fed prisons. Let's wrap up. Let's wrap up there. <laughs> Um, thank you everybody for listening um, you can find us on Twitter or Instagram at Red Menace Cast or on Facebook at the Red Menace Podcast you can find our merch at tpublic.com um, please if you can leave us a review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts um, tell your friends about the show because um, yeah. we need love and attention and this is the only way I know how to get it um, <laughs> we need validation basically yeah, exactly. Validations for our existence as people and as a show. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Good luck and good night. Good night.